So I've got an idea too, and we're going to get to it throughout this presentation. We've had some amazing talk of today, and you might be asking yourself, well, who's this guy? What has he done? Why does he deserve to be talking at TEDx Newey? Well, to be honest, I'm just a surfer and a citizen of this world who saw some things happening in his backyard that he really wasn't that pleased with, and has led me on a pretty amazing journey to do all that I can in my power to make a difference. So, the subject of my presentation, how did life become so plastic? I'm going to be talking to you today mostly about the concerns that I have around plastic pollution. What happens to our plastic when it gets loose in the environment and ultimately ends up in our oceans? We see here in this slide what happens after a heavy rain event in a developed country, in Los Angeles, actually, the LA River. Huge amount of uh, our rubbish that would have ultimately ended up in the ocean were it not for this engineering barrier that we see here. And thankfully, the municipality is going to some effort to try and grab it out. But what happens when we go to the other side of the equation and start looking at what's happening in developing nations in the world, where unfortunately there hasn't been a parallel relationship between the increase in plastic packaging and this use of this resource with the education nor the infrastructure to allow it to be collected. We see huge levels of plastic pollution all across developing nations. We estimate that around about 80% of the marine debris that ends up in our oceans does actually start on a, from a land-based source. 80% of it, that's estimated. That means around about 20% is actually coming from practices that happen at sea. So, where's that coming from? Well, shipping, boating, fishing, recreational activities, resource extraction. So now we're getting some sort of snapshot about why this stuff is getting out there in the first place. So where does it end up? Well, I just went to Away. In July this year, I took this image, which is of a beach in a very remote corner of the big island of Hawaii called Camillo Beach, or otherwise toted as Plastic Beach or the world's dirtiest beach. Now, what's shocking about this image is that it is a very remote area. And the detritus that we're seeing here hasn't come from Hawaii. In fact, it's come from sources up to 5,000 kilometres away. It's been transported there on oceanic currents, which make up the North Pacific subtropical gyre. It was really quite frightening to go there and to see this for myself after having researched and studied and been involved in this issue for some time. So where does it all end up if it doesn't end up on beaches? Well, unfortunately, we're seeing a huge impact of this plastic on wildlife right around the world. I remember seeing this image for the first time in 2009, taken by a fellow TED talker, Chris Jordan. It's of a juvenile lace and albatross on Midway Atoll, one of the most remote island chains on Earth. Now, these birds, this is actually a chick that was fed this plastic by the adult albatross, which forage over vast areas across the uh, North Pacific Gyre, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I remember looking at this image for the first time and going, what's to say that cigarette lighter didn't come from my hands? What's to say that bottle top wasn't a bottle top that I once upon a time used? I couldn't have any sort of guarantee that my waste couldn't end up doing that. And it was really quite frightening for me to, to digest that. It's not just the impacts of ingestion, the consumption of plastic, which is causing problems and causing a huge amount of concern across the world. We also have problems associated with entanglement. A lot of the debris which finds its way into the ocean is just perfectly shaped to be a real threat to these inquisitive species that unfortunately find their way in there. Look at all those bottle tops in that. That's another uh, carcass of an albatross, some monofilament fishing line, and this here, a six-pack ring, unfortunately, around this turtle. So this is not an isolated issue. We're not just talking about the impacts of this in some faraway lands in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean. This is happening in Australia. I've got two examples up on the screen here where you can kind of see some of that, both taken from 2011. First of all, we have a green sea turtle, a juvenile, that was washed up dead on a beach in Ballina uh, this year in June. Inside it, they did a necropsy. Inside this sea turtle was 317 pieces of plastic, hard and soft. And over on Lord Howe Island, we see a huge impact on the flesh-footed shearwater. This is a bird which roosts on Lord Howe Island, and the adults are foraging in the Tasman Sea. 
It's, it's our turf. So the plastic which is ending up in these birds has come from the east coast of Australia. This particular specimen was shown to have 276 pieces of plastic inside its stomach. And if we look at that in a relationship with uh, what it would be like for me, that's around about 12 kilograms of plastic crammed into my stomach. That's the, that's the equivalent we're dealing with here. So when I started learning about this issue, I really did feel, as a surfer, that I had to do something. Because for me, what I experience in the ocean is, well, it gives me so much. The ocean is my backyard, it's my playground, but it's also my temple where I become complete. So I did feel compelled to do something. So together with some colleagues, we started this organisation called Take Three, a clean beach initiative. What we're trying to do with this message is to change the face of trash, of rubbish. When we go out and we enjoy the environment, why don't we feel compelled to give a little bit back while we're there? So it started as a surfer. We thought, well, we can just leave the ocean. We've had an amazing experience. Let's just take three pieces of plastic when we leave the beach, give a little bit back, pay it forward. But we realise now the message can be taken everywhere because the ocean is downhill from everywhere. Every river leads to the sea. So my idea to spread to you is when you're out there in the environment, enjoying the beach or wherever, if you see a bit of trash on the ground, can we actually encourage people to take that giant leap of saying, I didn't put that there, but I will take it away for the betterment of the environment and of wildlife. So that's where we're going. And we're getting lots of traction with our message because it is so simple. It doesn't take any real time, doesn't cost you any money, and it can go a really long way to making a real difference. In July this year, we won a $50,000 grant from Taronga Zoo, which is amazing, and we've um, been doing lots of great things to bring awareness to the issue. I started feeling about what I could do to really boost the image, to get people talking about this issue in Australia and around the world. So in July this year, I set about going on a research expedition, sailing across the North Pacific Ocean all the way from Hawaii to Vancouver, 5,000 kilometres of ocean, to go and see this infamous Great Pacific Garbage Patch for myself. So we started in Hawaii where, as we saw before, horrific levels of plastic pollution washing up on those beaches from the North Pacific Gyre. Whilst I was shocked by that, I'd seen it before. What really broke my heart was this. What we're staring at here isn't sand. In between the crevices of these rocks is the remnants of other plastic items. We call it plastic sand. I've got a sample jar you can see here. When I stare into this jar, I can't recognise anything for what it once was. And that's because when plastic gets into the ocean, it doesn't actually retain its shape and structure for a great deal of time. With the photo degradation, with the physical disturbance being run around by boats, bashed against rocks and wood, it breaks apart. But it doesn't biodegrade. Plastic does not biodegrade. This will continue getting smaller and smaller right down to the molecular level. And it's this is the reason why it's physically impossible for us to do anything about cleaning up the plastic that's already in the ocean. We have to concentrate our efforts on stopping it getting there in the first place. I've got a little graphic here now which is going to explain to you how these oceanic gyres work. We hear a lot about this North Pacific gyre. What exactly is it? And we'll get this little graphic playing here now. It's going to show you what we're talking about. So we're hypothesising here. This is a model from the University of Hawaii what would happen if we rele released these drifter buoys into the ocean? Where would they converge? And after a couple of years, we start to see these little red spots forming. You notice there's not just the one in the North Pacific. We've got the one in the South Pacific, North and South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. There's five major oceanic gyres and lots more smaller ones all throughout the ocean. I bring you the unfortunate news is that I don't really feel like we have any pristine ocean left anymore because there's plastic in every single piece of ocean and every single beach in the world has some residue of plastic left in it. So this is where we went to go. We went to study this area here, which is called the Eastern Pacific Garbage Patch. And uh, like I said, 5,000 kilometres of sailing. The media has loved to call this place, oh, that floating island of trash the size of Texas. Sorry to burst your bubble, guys. The floating island doesn't exist. It never has. The media just love to blow it out of proportion. What we're dealing with is an immense plastic soup. I could look out over that boat and the ocean looked pretty much normal. It wasn't until we started getting down there and looking at it that you started to see the nature of it, which is it's mostly made up of small plastic pieces. Yes, we saw the large 
conglomerations of rope and net called ghost nets, lots of those. And you do see recognisable items like fishing buoys and also the odd occasional, like a consumer good, like a bowl. But they do break apart much faster, which is why we don't see them, we just see the remains. How we were doing our research was utilising this manta trawl to give a little skimming snapshot of this particular stretch of ocean at any one point in time. And what we see is that it is mostly this kind of smaller stuff mixed in with recognisable items. In this image here, we can actually see a couple of pen caps, like off a biro. There's a spray nozzle there from a uh, spray can. Toothbrush, of course. This guy, a toy plastic gorilla, like the kind of you'd find in a McCappy meal, 2,000 kilometres from the nearest landmass. And these guys here, this is a pre production plastic pellet. Before plastic even becomes something, it's a resin pellet we call a nurdle. Here we can see him up close, a little bit worse for wear, looking a little bit weathered. And all this stuff here is all organic matter, naturally occurring stuff. We did decide that we wouldn't have any stowaways doing uh, no work at all, so we got him on the ropes, and he uh, thankfully saved me getting a few calluses from uh, hoisting those sails. The other horrific images we saw here were these items that had been heavily degraded, selectively eaten by fish. All the rope that's out there now is, uh, is all plastic and coral growing on some items, just showing you this stuff has been out there for decades. And it's getting in our food chain. I hate to tell you, but these um, plastic pellets look just like the food source for a lot of species. So we are seeing these fish selectively grabbing this stuff and eating it. This is a popular restaurant dish, a uh, rainbow runner, 17 pieces of plastic inside it. This guy was an extreme sample from 2008 on a previous voyage. 84 plastic pieces inside a specimen nine centimetres long. Literally had gorged himself on plastic. These guys are a staple diet of your tuna, your mahi-mahi, the pelagic fish species that we love to eat. Which begs the question, how synthetic are we? Chemicals that are used in the manufacture of plastic have been tied back to a whole range of human conditions. If we know now that these species in the oceans, right from our zooplankton through to our whales, are consuming plastic, and we know the impacts of bioaccumulation, what is this going to mean for us? And thankfully, we have a lot of scientists around the world who are doing research into this, finding out if there is a link between the human health conditions, which are rising, some of them exponentially, and our relationship with plastic. So, what do we do? More importantly, what can you do? Because we can all walk away from here and make a difference on the issue of plastics, of plastic pollution. Where did it all go so wrong, okay? We haven't had plastics forever, have we? Okay, it wasn't really until after the post-Second World War boom, the baby boomers, that we really started to embrace plastic and unfortunately, throw away living. This is an image here from uh, a magazine in 1955 where the caption and the story read, life would be easier, why do the dishes when you can just throw it away? Isn't that a little bit insane? To highlight that a little bit more, I'd love to show you this graphic here that I'll read out to you because I just think it's so poignant by uh, artist Max Temkin. It's pretty amazing that our society has reached a point where the effort necessary to extract oil from the ground, ship it to a refinery, turn it into plastic, shape it appropriately, truck it to a store, buy it and bring it home, is considered to be less effort than what it takes to just wash the spoon when you're done with it. We have to realise that single-use disposable living is ridiculous. Why? Plastic is petroleum. We're using this finite resource for items that we use for a fraction of time. And we're going to more and more lengths to make cheap access to petroleum. And unfortunately, we saw that recently with the Deepwater Horizon spill. So what do we do? Education. My organisation, Take Three, is committed on trying to get a movement happening, first with our youth and throughout the entire generations of the world. We want to change the face of trash. We want to make it so that you guys understand that this stuff isn't inert. When you throw it in the bin, it's not just going away, it sticks around forever. We used more plastic in the first 10 years of the 21st century than we ever did before we even had it. Okay, so that means we did use more in the first 10 years than we did in the entire 20th century, ever before. And if, unless it's been incinerated, every single piece of plastic ever made is still in existence somewhere. So I'm a big fan of legislation. I'm becoming quite radical on this issue because when you've seen what I've seen and you know what I know, you really realise stuff needs to be done to make a difference. 
Ban the bag, get rid of them. Three states and territories in Australia now have plastic bag bans. South Australia, NT, ACT, they have plastic bag bans. Let's get it national. Let's also introduce the national scheme for a 10 cent deposit on beverage containers. We have to do this. It increases the recycling rates to 90% or we're wallowing with these very low rates in other states. South Australia has it, NT's getting it in 2012. We need that nationwide. So visit the Boomerang Alliance, of which I'm affiliated, to tell your ministers that we want that 10 cent scheme. Obviously, we need to better manage our waste, okay? When you go down the beach and it's kind of the bins overflowing, but you're like, oh yeah, but it's rubbish. Oh, you've got to put it in there, okay? Whose problem is that? Is it your problem for putting it there, or is it a municipal, uh, a municipal problem for not, they're not taking better services? It's a complex issue, but we need to manage our waste better so it doesn't get into the environment. We definitely need better product design. We've all been fed an idea that recycling is the cure-all for consumption. Just pop it in that yellow bin, it's okay. All right, with glass, with cardboard, with paper, that's somewhat realistic, because it does go into a closed loop. It can become that item again. Plastic, that is very rare. More often than not, it's downcycled into a product that cannot then be recycled. It only really gets one more life. A better product uh, design, cradle to cradle design, closed loop systems is what we need. Recycling is good, I'm a big supporter, but we can do it better. More simple than that, please start embracing reusable living, okay? This is what we had, this is what your parents and your grandparents had. They didn't make things to throw away, that was deemed stupid, okay? What we can do is replace our Disposable living with reusable living. It isn't that hard. I carry a bottle with me. I carry a keep cup, coffee cup. I've even got a glass straw that stays in my, uh, my little day bag. We can do this. We can embrace it. Please support it. Obviously, we need to change the systems that are going on at sea to make them better managed so we don't have a 20% influx of other debris. And, of course, as I advocate, clean up our world. Get out there. The satisfaction that I feel when I'm coming out of the surf and I see that bottle cap on the shoreline, I just grab and pick it up, I feel so proud. And I hope that you guys will go and embrace it and take it too, because if we don't, this may just be the beach of the future. It's already happening in Hawaii. How long before our local beaches start looking like this? Thank you. <laughs>